Church, how are we? Good to see you this morning. If you are um, a child up to second grade, going into, into second grade, and you want to go to children's church now, um, you can follow Miss Emily. You can make your way to this door. Um, if you're a guest through, and you have kids through second grade, we'd love to get them connected to our children's church where they're going to go and, and hear about the Lord, hear about Jesus, and be, be able to continue to worship. Um, so as they're making that transition, um, that is from the next episode of The Chosen. If you want to come back and worship with us on Wednesday, we eat a meal at 5.30, and then at 6.30 we, we show the episode of The Chosen and give you some discussion questions to go home and seek scripture and, and talk to your kids or your spouse about, about what you see. So um, as they're continuing to go out, um, uh, we are really, really excited, as already been mentioned about Falls Creek, and Reed's doing an excellent job leading our students, and, and we're seeing some growth, um, some, some spiritual growth, some numeric growth. We are really excited about what God's doing in our student ministry, and I just want to echo what he said about praying, um, because we're, we're really excited about that. And, but he said something while he was talking about his vision for um, Falls Creek for students to come to know the Lord. Listen, that's my vision for today, all right? You might be here today um, God might have, he's might, maybe he's been working in your heart, maybe right now, and it's unexpectedly to you, he's, he's working in your heart. My hope is that by the end of the day, you've given your life, you've given your life to Jesus. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to John chapter 3, John chapter 3, and ab about eight years before I met my wife, before I met Randy, um, I met her dad, who would become my father-in-law. I was in eighth grade. Um, I was a baseball player playing in the same conference in which he coached. And so I, I've known, I knew my father-in-law much longer than I've known, than I've known my wife, about eight years longer than I've, I've known my wife. And I've thought back a lot um, about, about how many times maybe um, mine and Randy, maybe our paths crossed, and, and we didn't even know it. We didn't even know it. You know, I was, I was four, I'm four years, four, or four grades, four grades older, four grades older than my, than my wife, and so she was, just, when I was in eighth grade, she was itty, itty bitty, itty bitty, right? And so now, I, she still hasn't been honest with me, because I'm thinking that she's probably sitting up there in the stand saying, oh, I hope I get to marry that guy one of these days. That's probably what she's saying. It's not, not on, not on, not even on my radar, not even on my radar. It, it, it's, it's funny, it's strange to think how many times our paths had to cross um, and didn't even know it, but, but really also because we were in two totally different walks of life um, at, that, at, at that time. At that time, two totally different walks of life. So close, so close, but completely different worlds. You know, as I, as I even think about that, I wonder, I wonder sometimes if we're like that with Jesus. You know, maybe you've never given your life to the Lord, and maybe he's not even on your radar. Uh, I wonder, like, how, like maybe even today, if, if he's drawing you, if his path is crossing with yours, drawing you. But I also wonder, as believers, as believers, how many times is God at work around us? How many times is God speaking? How many times is his Holy Spirit just sort of flooding this room, moving in and out of the aisles. We can't even see it. We can't see it. I wonder how many times how close he draws, if he draws near to us, and we don't even know it, if we don't even recognize it. And as I've read this text um, this week, and I've been back and forth and praying through um, what, what, what to preach, because we're in the mid middle of this series, living living with Jesus, and I've just felt the weight, I've felt this text of a group of people that Jesus is working around them, but they don't even get it. And I don't want that to be us today. I want us to feel this text. I want us to feel the weight of what we read as we think, as we think about how Jesus must increase in our lives. Before we look at John chapter 3, let me invite you to bow, and as we do every week, let me just invite you to ask Jesus to speak to you, ask God to speak to your heart this morning. Take just a, a, a moment to do that, to ask God to speak to your heart this morning.
And after you've asked him to speak, I want you to ask yourself, what am I going to do with what he says? And God, that is our prayer. We know you're at work around us. We know you're moving even in this place. So God, would you speak to us this morning? And when we walk out of this place in just a little bit, when we move out of this place in just a little bit, may you have increased in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our actions, in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you found this text, if you would stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word, John chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 22. It says, after this, after, after John 3.16, right? After his encounter with Nicodemus. But, but we're in verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Enon near Salem because water was plentiful there. And people were coming to be baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. That was part of what we saw a minute ago in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the film, um, alluded to John one day going to prison. Now verse 25, Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, He's baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase. I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. But he who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he's seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever does receive his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. The wrath of God remains on him. And friends, this is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. The whole basis, the whole basis of this, of this conversation, um, the, the, the main idea, the thesis of John's message here is in verse 30 that he must increase and I must decrease. Now, now that sounds that sounds really good and that sounds right and that sounds like what we want that that Jesus must increase in our lives and, and and we must decrease that sounds good that's the Sunday school answer but John truly believes it and it's changed the way he's lived his life now, now we're going to see some other guys here that up to this point Jesus has not increased and their desire is not for Jesus to increase and listen, if Jesus is not increasing in my life, then who is? All right? If Jesus is not increasing in your life, who is increasing? We're, we're going to see that it's either Jesus increasing or it's myself, it's me. It's me increasing. Okay, we're going to look at two, two areas here, two, two, two places, two people that, that can increase in our lives. Number one, number one, I want to talk about the self Self first increasing. And I want to point out, number one, that where selfishness increases, satisfaction decreases. Which, which sounds a little, a little 
counterintuitive, right? It sounds opposite, like, like if, if what I want and my desires, if that increases and I get that, you would think that I'd be more satisfied, that I'd be more happy, that I'd have more joy in life. But, but we're going to see in this text that the opposite actually happens. That whenever, whenever I get more of me, rather than being satisfied, satisfaction actually de- decreases. Where selfishness increases, satisfaction decreases. Now, now where we are in John chapter 3, you have these large crowds up to this point that have been following John, John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a very charismatic lead, leader. He dresses differently than everyone else. He eats the things differently than everything everyone else eats. He, he has a way of going after the religious leaders, calling them snakes and, and all these things, um, calling them names. And it's like the crowds, they love it. The crowds come out maybe to see a show, maybe to draw near to the Lord, but John has this this massive following, so much so um, that in verse 23, he's got to go to a place where there's lots of water to be able to baptize all those who are coming to him. These large crowds are coming to him, but something happens. The, The large crowds flip, and they no longer follow John. They start to follow Jesus. It's kind of like college football recruiting. Like I, I, I keep up with that because I want to know where's OU in the college football recruiting ratings. And I know y'all want to, some of y'all want to know where OSU is and, and who's number one and, and what, what recruits are we getting. And, and, and as I'm following these stories, it, it really irritates me. It irritates me when someone is like committed to OU and then they flip their commitment and go to OSU, right? Or, or they're committed to OSU and they flip their commitment and go to OU. And so I'm like, I'm celebrating. It's, it's, a, it's a fun thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. That's what's happening here. These crowds are committed to following John, and then they flip, and then they start following Jesus. And look, look what happens in verse, in verse 25. Let me show you what happens. It says, Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. Now, we don't know what this discussion is. We don't know what this argument is. Um, we, don't, we don't know what's being said. But we do know that what happens is John's disciple leaves and he's upset. All right? You ever, you ever been in a discussion, um, a, an argument, a disagreement where you leave upset? Like, that's what's going on here. We don't know what they're saying. It just says this discussion um, arises and all this Jews do, we don't, know, we don't know what he's being said, we don't know the specifics, but he's stirring the pot. He, he's stirring things, he's stirring things up. And here's how we know that, because look what happens next in verse 26. So they go to John, they go to John and they said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. So, so John's disciple that, that probably has maybe, maybe invested a lot of money in John's ministry, maybe walked away from a profession to follow John the Baptist, and like, like everybody's flocking to him, and it's really exciting, right? It's kind of like, like today we had to bring in, we had to bring in more chairs um, um, to, to, help, to better help accommodate people that were coming. That's exciting, right? Like who wants to take chairs out um, because, there's not, because people aren't, because people aren't filling, filling, the, filling, filling the place? Like, like up to this point, John's disciples have been, been, been really excited because they're popular. Everywhere they go, this crowd follows, and John's, John's disciples, those who follow John, are excited because they're popular. Right? They're popular. And now he's complaining, hey, they're, they're not following us anymore, they're following, they're following Jesus. Several years ago, while in college, I was in a, uh, a praise and worship band and, and loved to be able to, to play and go to different groups and stuff. And, and, and we played a lot, we did play a lot of different venues, if you will, but, but my favorite place to go was pre teen camp. All right? Pre teen camp. Because, because these little pre teens, when we showed up with our trailer and our equipment, all, and we get out and we, and, we, and we lead worship or do a concert, um, what, whatever we were doing, like they thought we were the Beatles, okay? For, for a younger crowd, they thought we were the Jonas Brothers. You know, they, I mean, they just, they just thought we were, we were it. 
And so af- after this, after this, we had these little CDs that we had made. We had these little T-shirts that we had made. Af- after, the, after we got done with our concert for the night, then they would just be lined up to have a sign, to sign their, um, okay, your pastor, your pastor, okay? I mean, that, that's funny, right? That's funny, okay? And so, and so that, that was awesome, um, really popular, at least with this little group that we're playing with. Then, then, I, then I go and, 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 and graduate college, go into pastoral ministry, and th- then I'm speaking, then I'm the, the, the camper speaking at things like Cross Timbers and Falls Creek and, and KBA, these, these different events, and guess what? Same, same thing. You're the camp pastor, guy. Okay? Come, come eat in our cabin. Come, come do all these things. And so, man, this is this is really great, really exciting. They they're here to see me, right? All, all, all this, okay. So I, I preached at Cross Timbers a couple weeks ago, and, and and get this, get this. Randy and Kate went to Cro- where Cross Timbers is um, for Camp Perfect Wings, like like two weeks before I went to speak at at Cross Timbers. And at Camp Perfect Wings, it's a special needs camp for. For kids all the way up to adults with special needs and so so Kate's there and you, and you know her personality right like if you've been around her she's like a firecracker she's a firecracker and so so I go and I'm speaking at cross timbers and no one like like they're, they're not excited about me the staff isn't excited about me you know what I was known as at, at, as the camp pastor you're Kate's dad you're Kate's dad with all the staffers all the staffers you're Kate they didn't even know my name they just knew I was Kate's dad what will that do for, for an ego, right? The, the campers, the campers, they didn't, they, they didn't know me. They didn't care about me. You know how I was known at, for, to the campers? I was known as Allie's dad um, to the campers. She was there as a camper. She was there as a camper that week. Deflating my ego, right? They don't, they don't care about me. I'm, I'm now known as my kids, my kid's dad. John's, John's disciples who were popular, Everywhere John went, oh, that's John the Baptist. Everywhere um, they went, his little cronies were there with him. This, this is one of them. He's popular. Everybody notices him. Now, now they're all upset. What are they displaying? The selfishness. No one's here to see me. No one's here. No one cares about me. There's no followers near me. No one's listening to me see when selfishness increases satisfaction decreases now here here's what's mind-boggling about this whole thing did you notice what john's disciples are complaining about they're complaining that that people are following jesus they're not following us. John, they're not following us anymore. They're following that Jesus guy over there. Now, how, what are they doing? You think churches ever like that? You think churches ever don't care if people follow him or not as long as I get my way? I pastored a church um, once and in the area where I lived, not far from where I was pastoring, there was a new church plant. And this new church plant went from zero, literally, to about 700, almost overnight. And you know what the people were saying at the church I pastored? They were saying, um, well, they must not be preaching the gospel, must not be doing something right. You know what they were showing? They were were, were jealous, jealous, because people were starting to go over here so making every excuse on why something can't be right, why the, what they're doing is wrong. Even though I, I was happy people were coming to Jesus. Same, same church, same church, baptizing lots and lots of people. For a while it was like almost near, nearly every week baptizing people. One of the deacons said, you know what? Um, we're filling the baptistry too many weeks. We're, we're burning too much natural gas, heating the baptistry. Why don't we baptize less weeks? We'll just put this arbitrary date over here, and then, then whoever wants to can be. And I'm thinking, you're worried about $5 to fill the baptistry when people are coming to Jesus? The argument's silly here. 
It's not how they want it. They're not as popular as they once were. And it's killing them. Where selfishness increases. Satisfaction decreases. What about you? Do you care more about people coming to Jesus or simply about getting your way? If it's selfishness, where selfishness increases, satisfaction decreases. But, the text doesn't stop there. Number two, where Jesus increases, joy increases. Where Jesus increases, joy increases. So look at verse 27. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. So what, what John's trying to do in John's response to the to the disciple to his disciple that's saying they're they're leaving us, they're following Jesus. We're not as popular as we used as we used to be. This this disciple who has selfish motivations to what he's wanting to do. John the Baptist, the only, his point, the point he's trying to, to make is that all they need is Jesus. He's saying, hey, so you're really going to get upset about them following the guy I came to tell, to tell you about? Like I, From the start, I've been saying that I, this, is, this isn't it. It doesn't end with me. There's someone else coming. I've told you who he, who he is. He's, tr- he's, he's pointing with everything he can. He's pointing them to Jesus. Then less of me, more of Jesus. Now look at verse 29. Look, look how he's going he's to continue this. He's going to say, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. And all, throughout, all throughout Scripture, all throughout the New Testament, um, Jesus is described as, as the bridegroom. His church, his people is described as the bride. He's using this imagery here of a, of a wedding, of a bride and a groom. He says the one who, who has the bride, that's the bridegroom. I'm not, the, I'm not the bridegroom, the one who has the bride. He's the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, in verse 29, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and just, just hears him, just is in his presence, he rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. He's saying, my joy is increasing, just, just hearing, just, just being in the presence of Jesus. That's where my joy is. And so he's going to say at the end of verse 29, Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. It's complete because I've seen Jesus. I've heard Jesus. I've testified. I've pointed people towards Jesus. Now look what he says in verse 30. The thesis of all this. He must increase. But I must decrease. See, for John... The joy is not the number of crowds that are coming out to hear him preach. The joy for John is not how many households know his name. The joy for John is not to be invited to this banquet or this event. For John, there's one one object of his joy and it's all wrapped up in Jesus. So for him, it's not, how can I get my way, or how can it be like this? How, how can it be how I like things? It's, I must decrease. He must increase. Now the context here of John and where he's going is super, super important. Okay, it, it, we've already read in verse 24 that John had not yet been put in prison, but that's where he's going. 
John's going to go, in, go into prison. And that, that passage that our Scripture readers had read here, you can go back and, and look at this, because John, when he's in prison, he starts to doubt. He starts to, to wonder, did I get it right? They chop his head off for standing against those in power and their ungodly ways. They execute him. So, so, so understand the context that John is saying this in the future context. It's within the context of suffering. My joy is complete. It doesn't matter how much I suffer. It doesn't matter what I go through, that there's joy, and my joy is complete because my joy is not tied to the circumstances or popularity or possessions or any of these things. The joy that I have is in knowing Jesus. You know, Scripture, Scripture guarantees our suffering. Any, any who desire to live a godly life will, will suffer, is what Scripture is going to say. Some, some around the world face persecution. Some have health challenges. Um, some have um, problems in marriage and family. You, you are going to suffer. In fact, in fact, there's a lot of you here today that have said that that can tell me that can tell me stories in their life of just going through great suffering. And it doesn't matter how deep that suffering is. If it's your suffering, it feels like the weight of the world's on your shoulders, doesn't it? Some of you have been there. Some of you are in it right this, month, right this minute. Loss of a loved one, loss of a job, spouse walked out, kids in rebellion. You are walking through suffering, health challenges. You're in, you're in the middle of it. And the ones of you who are blessed right now that are not going in through suffering, chances are you're going to walk into something tomorrow. See, we think, we think that if we're sold out to Jesus, we're exempt. Not John the Baptist, who Jesus is going to later say, of all the men born of women, there's none that compares to John the Baptist. We will suffer. But you know what John's saying? That where Jesus increases, joy, joy increases. I've told you stories of being in the hospital 1,500 miles away with no one I knew, no one playing, playing tag, coming back with our other kids, Kate, Kate going through a 15 half hour open heart surgery, having a stroke during the process. Days not even knowing that I, could, that if I was going to even be able to make it. Not even knowing if I could make it to the end of the day. Not even knowing if she would make it to the end of the day. And, and I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, that when the Spirit of the Lord floods that place, no matter how alone that you feel, you're not alone. No matter how dark the day is, there's hope in Christ. And when you're so stressed and so overwhelmed by what life throws at you, and you wonder if you'll ever even be able to smile again, that there is a joy that is real, that goes deeper than your circumstance. Because it's not tied to what's going on around you. According to John, it's tied exclusively to Jesus increasing in your life. I don't get mad Christians. I don't get Christians that are angry all the time. But 
feel as if they've got to make their point on social media or they've got to have the last word or they got don't get that. Because joy is not tied to that. Joy increases when Jesus increases. Joy. Isn't that what every heart craves? I I, I haven't met anybody that have said, you know what, I just want to be mad today. I could probably guess that might be what some people are thinking, but I... I've never heard anybody come out and say it. Every heart longs for joy. According to this text, where Jesus increases, joy increases. So, we need more Jesus. Verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. That, that's why you can have joy even on the darkest of days because Jesus is above above that. He's above your circumstance. He's, he who has, is of the earth, verse 31, belongs to the earth and speaks in, a, speaks in an earthly way. He who, he who comes from heaven is above all. Verse 32, he bears witness to what he's seen and heard. Yet no one receives his testimony, but whoever does, whoever receives his testimony, sets his zeal to this that God is true. See, the reality is you're either going to be number one or number two. Your life is either going to be you increasing. In this endless loop of chasing after things and thinking, well, if I just get this, or if I just get here, or if I just get my way, then, then I'll be happy. But it, until the next thing comes up, right? You, are, you and I, we're either going to be number one, that selfish, or number two, we're going to be number two, and Jesus is going to increase in our lives. That's going to lead to joy. What would happen if Jesus increased in your life? What would happen if Jesus increased in your marriage? What would happen if Jesus increased in your finances? What would happen if Jesus increased in your parenting? What would happen if Jesus increased in your relationship towards your parents? What would happen if Jesus increased at work? What would happen if Jesus increased in your hobbies? See, if Jesus, what happens if he increased in your mind? What happened if he increased in your actions? I don't know the specifics of what that looks like, but here's what I promise. You'd have a whole lot more joy. And verse 34 says, He whom God has sent utters the words of God, for He gives the Spirit without measure. It means all the Jesus, all the Holy Spirit you'll ever need He's already given it to you without measure if you belong to Him. You might not be tuned in. You might be sitting here bored as a fence post. That's not Jesus' fault. That's not God's fault. He's given you, He's given me the Spirit without measure. All you need for joy, all you need in life, you already have. In Christ. He gives the Spirit without measure. And so the, the, the fruits of the Spirit that we, that we just mentioned briefly last week, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all those things, all those, all those areas that you lack, that I lack. He's already given it to us in Christ without measure. And when you walk in that, you're going to walk in a lot of joy. These teenagers are going to go and spend all week at Falls Creek with the Lord. They're going to come back, and you're going to notice it for those who know Christ. And you're going to call it the Falls Creek High, and you're going to call it all these things. We've we, we got names for it. When, re, when reality is, they've spent 24-7 just 
in the presence of Jesus. You better believe they're going to come back affected and joyful. Look how this ends. It's super important how this ends. In verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. You know what that means? That means that Jesus has whatever you need. And so if you're grieving, He knows what you need and He has what you need. If you're, if you're walking in despair and lack of peace, He knows what, what you need. He has what you need. It's all, it's all in His hand. If you're walking in brokenness, He has what you need. That's why we can trust Him and walk in joy because the Father's given the Son every, all things into His hand. Verse 36, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It seems as if Scripture keeps going back and back and back and back to this idea of belief. Not just an idea of, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I'll say a prayer so I can go to heaven. Not just belief, not just a cognitive belief, but a belief that changes you. That's why the very next sentence after talking about belief, he talks about obedience. Because real faith in Jesus, true faith in Jesus, saving faith in Jesus, is a cognitive belief that changes the way we live our lives. So maybe you're here, and you're like, what do, I, what, do I, what do I even do? Can I tell you, if you've never committed your life to Him, never gone all in, that's the first thing you do. If you place your faith and trust in Jesus, you place your belief in Jesus, that His death on the cross was enough to satisfy God's wrath, what we read about, for your sins. That his resurrection proved that he was stronger than your sin and he's stronger than death. And he did that for you. That you place your you put your faith and your belief in that, that he did it for you. And then you repent, you turn from your sins, you turn from you being the boss of your life to going all in with Jesus. If you've not done that, man, make a beeline to one of your pastors. We'll be at these back doors. Pastor Reed will be back here. Myself, Pastor Kurt, will be at this door in a second. You make a beeline to us if you need to give your life to Jesus. As soon as, we, as, soon as I pray and we start singing in the stand, you find us. But maybe there, there are some believers in this room that you find yourself like John's disciples. And you know your mission. You, you know, you know because it's been ingrained in you that you should be about Jesus and His glory. But somewhere along the way that has shifted and you've grown cold or apathetic or selfish in what you want, when you want it, how you want it, rather than lifting up the name of King Jesus. I found all throughout life that the God that saves me is the God that continues to hold me and continues to forgive me, and continues to walk with me, and continues to grow me. Maybe this is a big grow day for you. To come and say, I've been selfish. Jesus, would you increase in me? And know the joy that will flood your soul. Let's pray.